throughout history, in every land, with or without the Bible, man has worshipped. Man may worship the sun. He may worship a cow. He may worship a tree. He may worship a piece of carved wood. He may worship a piece of chiseled stone. He may worship the true living God. He may worship himself. But man is a worshiping creature. With or without the Bible in every land and every age, man has demonstrated that. Worship. Our English word worship literally means worth ship. If you look it up in the dictionary, you'll find its origin coming from that literal definition, worth ship. And it simply denotes an object or a person or being of some sort that is considered worthy of honor and devotion and is therefore the object of worship. Now when you read the word worship in the New Testament, you need to be aware of the fact that it translates the Greek that means to kiss the hand toward or to fall prostrate before, to do obeisance to, or to bow in the presence of, or to welcome reverently. And so when we think about the meaning of the word worship, worth, devotion, whether an object or a person, to bow before, to pay homage to, to kiss the hand toward, it raises the question, who or what shall be the object of our worship? Before whom or before what will we bow? And that question is answered clearly and emphatically in the Word of God. I want you to read with me this morning three scriptures and we start with the last book of the New Testament, the book of Revelation. I want you to turn your Bible and if you didn't bring yours, borrow one from the songbook rack and read for we are about to read a scripture with which many of us are not as familiar as some other scriptures. From Revelation chapter 22, the very last chapter of the Bible. Revelation chapter 22, verses 8 and 9. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. Now stop your reading and if you look back, see we're at verse 8, if you look at the first seven verses and what goes before that in chapter 21, you know that John has just been given a glimpse of the holy city, New Jerusalem, the place that we would call heaven. And he's now seen that and heard that. Now look at verse 8 again. And I, John, saw these things and heard them and when I heard, had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, 
see thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. I am intrigued when I read those two verses, wondering what was in the mind of John at that moment. Had he been so impressed, even overwhelmed by what he had just seen, and that this angel of God, this ministering servant of God had just revealed to him that he, in his being overwhelmed, just felt the need to just fall down and worship at the feet of that angel. But the angel said, don't you do it. You worship God, not me. Now, turn your Bible all the way back to the Old Testament, to the book of Isaiah. To the book of Isaiah, chapter 6. And here we're going to read eight verses that present to us a very impressive picture of reverence and all before God. Isaiah 6, beginning at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also... I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. In that passage of Scripture, Isaiah saw the glory of the Lord. I do not believe that he literally had seen the king, as he stated, as it's found in verse 5. For the Bible says no man can see God and live. He did not literally see him, but obviously is meaning that he saw the manifestation of God. He saw the glory, the grandeur of God. And then he saw more than the glory of God. He saw his own unworthiness in the presence of God and said, I'm a man so undone, a man of unclean lips. Folks, we're talking about the prophet Isaiah who saw himself in that way 
And if Isaiah saw himself as being an undone and unclean man, do I dare see myself any less or any more? And then he saw his mission that he would go forth from that moment serving God. What a picture that he looked and saw him. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. The earth is full of his glory. And now turn to the book of Exodus. To the book of Exodus to chapter 19. And as you turn there, I remind you that this text is a record of that which took place three months to the day after the children of Israel were released from Egyptian bondage. Three months to the very day that they had escaped the tyranny of Pharaoh. And they came to the foot of the mount that we call Sinai. And there God called out unto Moses with the purpose of giving to Moses the laws that he was to carry to his people. And in giving him that calling, I want you to notice something that is indeed impressive. Start reading with me now at verse 16. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the nether part of the mount. They were keeping their distance. And Mount Sinai was all together on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. And the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and waxed louder and louder, Moses spake, and God answered him by a voice. And the Lord came down upon Mount Sinai on the top of the mount and the Lord called Moses up to the top of the mount. And Moses went up. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, charge the people, lest they break through unto the Lord to gaze, and many of them perish. And let the priest also which come near to the Lord sanctify themselves, lest the Lord break forth upon them. And Moses said unto the Lord, The people cannot come up to Mount Sinai, for thou chargest us, saying, Set bounds about the mount and sanctify it. And the Lord said unto him, Away, get thee down, and thou shalt come up, thou and Aaron with thee, but let not the priest and the people break through to come up unto the Lord, lest he break forth upon them. So Moses went down unto the people and spake unto them. And God spake all these words, saying, 
I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Folks, I hope you are impressed by the reading of this. I hope that it has given you a fresh awareness of God. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 111 verse 9, Holy and reverend is his name. That doesn't mean his name is holy. That doesn't mean his name is reverend. It means his name is to be reverenced. His very name is holy. And in Hebrew schools that are conducted in the Orthodox Jewish faith, there are those who will not even write his name. They consider it profane to do so. No wonder the psalmist said in Psalm 33, verse 8, Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the earth stand in awe of Him. Worship God. He's almighty. He's all powerful. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. He spoke this earth into existence. He spoke the sun and the moon and the stars into existence. He took a pile of dirt and made man with all of his marvelous qualities. He blessed a virgin and made her the mother of the Son of God. He raised that son from the dead. And he has said, the day is coming when I will destroy this earth, not with water, but with fire. He's almighty. He knows everything. He is everywhere 
all the time. The psalmist said in Psalm 139, where can I go and be away from God? And his answer was nowhere. For he said, if I can ascend into the heavens as high as a bird can fly, you're there. If I go into the depths, the bowels of the earth, you're there. There's no place where God is not. Now you and I can't do that. We can be in one place at a time and one place only at a time. But God is not flesh. God is spirit. And he's capable of and is indeed everywhere all the time. And the Hebrew writer said in Hebrews 4.13 that the one with whom we have to do sees everything. There is nothing hidden from his sight. He himself said to Samuel when Samuel was going about the process of finding a replacement for King Saul that man looks on the outward appearance but God looks upon the heart for Samuel 16 7 and therefore since he looks upon the heart of man and nothing is hidden from his eyes no wonder Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 12 13 that when the judgment takes place he'll even judge the secrets of your heart for he knows what they are. He knows everything. The psalmist said in Psalm 90 verse 2 that the Lord God is from everlasting unto everlasting. He's always been. I cannot comprehend that. He has just declared that he's always been and always will be. Now I am now eternal, having been created by the Lord. For though my flesh dies, my soul will live on eternally. But I'm not from everlasting to everlasting, for there was a time when I was not. There was a time when I became. But there has never been a time when God was not. He is from everlasting to everlasting. His words are sure. His promises are all kept. His laws are perfect. His every action is righteous. I don't dare question him. I know that what he does is right. He is the God of love. He is love. And he is the God of mercy. His mercy endures forever. He is a God of goodness. He is the God of severity and judgment and his judgments are flawless. This God about whom I speak and before whom we come to worship is the God of Adam, the God of Noah, the God of Moses, the God 
of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Elijah, the God of the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul. He is the God with whom you and I must deal. You cannot run away from him. You cannot escape his judgment. And thankfully, you're never outside of his presence and his blessings. This is the God in whose presence we are right now. And he's aware of you and where you are and what you're doing. Worship God. Open your song books, please, to the number announced. Music recognition selected. Screen.